Hi guys and welcome to this edition of the Your Progress is Our Passion podcast with me Dave Cottrell. I'm joined by a very special guest today. A lot of people often ask me, um, I'm always kind of out there helping other people with their mindset, who do I go to when I need mind sorting? Well this man taught me how to kind of self-medicate on this and how to sort it myself but whenever I feel like I need a bit of an upgrade, some new knowledge or just a maybe a different way of thinking, then this is the person I go to. To my right, I have Mr. Stephen H. Hello. I first met him through Ben Coomberg, part of Body Type Nutrition. Saw him on the Academy, um, the conference about 18 months ago. I've been over, done half a day with him, and right now I'm well towards the end of a, of a two-day session. We did a bit of physical stuff yesterday with a bit of lifting. Um, we did, and we're doing more mindset-based stuff today. I'll let Steve tell you a little bit about himself and the story of how he got to being the mindset guy from being the kettlebell guy. So from being the martial arts guy, from being the back in the dark ages of leaving school as an apprentice electrician with no idea what life was about. So in terms of training, you started off um, doing a bit of all sorts. Like, Pretty much, yeah. I mean, my I left school completely messed up at school, left with a C in English, D and E and everything else, and become an apprentice electrician based on kind of parents' advice. Stuck with that for four years, got laid off, took three lots of three month contracts as a qualified electrician, got laid off, saw a pattern, kind of was able to fast forward that fortunately, and realized that I probably didn't want to do this for the rest of my life. I was Influenced by a couple of very close friends that were at uni, and I mean, it's a very interesting story. They were having quite deep and meaningful discussions on philosophy, they were studying psychology, they were very intelligent people. And one of the brothers threw a dictionary at me and said, Read that, and you can join in. <laughs> and laugh as you will, that really hit home because I, I really saw these people as way above me. You know, stuff they were talking about concepts and things that I struggled to understand. And I thought, who am I relative to them? How do I, how do I join this gang and fit in in some way? So I was the first person in the history of my family to actually go to university. Done an undergrad in psychology. Went on many years after that to do a master's in strength and conditioning. Backgrounds mainly martial arts, taekwondo, kung fu, kettlebells, Olympic lifting, gymnastics, cycling, many, many things. I've always been, I'd say, a fitness addict, is putting it mildly. I was <laughs> addicted. I was sometimes training four to five hours a day. Pretty good at what I did. Uh, fit as a fiddle, lightning fast, and at the age of nearly 42, actually, that's tomorrow. So any cards, seven hours a day before the month. <laughs> You kind of slow down a bit, family appears, you chill out, you ask why you do things. And that was one of the main reasons that I ended up as a mindset coach because I was honest enough and ready to ask probably the only question that you should ask yourself as an adult. Are you happy? And I call it the Djokovic, the return serve, you know, yeah, life's good, no problems. I really let that question sink in and it went past my security guard, my knee jerk reactions. And about five minutes later, it went plunk. And the answer came back, no. And it was a very honest answer because outside, I had the family, I had the transport and the house and a trophy cabinet full of achievements and world rock records in one-arm lifting and things like that. But a lot of it was for show, for feedback, to hide the fact that I wasn't confident, that I found relationships difficult, that I second-guessed stuff, that I didn't value myself, that I found it awkward in social situations trying to second-guess them, how do I fit in, what if they don't like me or not. I would overthink to the extent that I didn't show up and then went back in the gym and developed more skills because I thought they would like me better this way. And the result of asking that question was the journey that allowed me to bring awareness to what I did and achieve inner peace. Because I can remember for many years that my only goal for life was actually inner peace. 
And the irony is that I didn't have it because I insisted on looking for it. Okay. Inner peace is a state of being when you get rid of the conditioning, the objections and the attachments and the wanting to grab the best version of you at some point in the future. It's really the essence. It's the stripping back of everything that's stopping you being present to now and accepting what is. And when you arrive in the literal sense and are at peace, you're no longer at war with inside or the person in the mirror. Outside isn't pushing and pulling you and making you do things that you'd rather not do. Life begins to flow. And the results of that is guest speaker at conferences, talks for Paul, helping thousands of people, running a successful business, being asked to go in and do corporate events, creating courses, having people travel far and wide to come and spend the day with you, or two days or three days. And when you're aligned with your gifts, and that's a big thing, when you realize your worth and you're out there so that people can actually find you, all of a sudden you'll change the world in your own special way. And it took a long time to arrive. I would say I was a, a 20 year overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> That is no longer a work in progress, but is well aware that there's still a lot of work to be done. I'm learning. I, I learn as much from you as you learn from me. The way we look at things, we reframe it. We see it from a different perspective. It's a paradigm shift. We did a stream yesterday where we, we dealt with many questions from people. There's new ways of seeing things when you're put on the spot, similar to now. You know, This, this isn't a dress rehearsal. This is round one, and we're going to nail it first time. You're on the spot and you deliver, and that for me is the art of coaching. Mm. Confidence, authority, not ego, beat your chest, I'm Superman. Authority, knowing that you know enough to help people, and actually taking that out into the world, because a lot of people will benefit from the fact that you show up and care. Awesome. That's me. So, once you realize, you know, once you, you ask yourself that question, the answer came back, no. Mm. Well, I want to ask you about the first steps, but what I want to, want to ask is, what was the first step you actually took to go towards happiness? But I also want to know what was the first significant step? Because sometimes the first steps we take aren't the ones that make the difference. There was a hell of a lot of reflection. There was a lot of awareness. There was a lot of, there was a lot of time out, if I'm honest. I spent a year blowing half my savings. I didn't work for about, about, about a year, give or take. I read possibly two to three books every week. I immersed myself in a very different gym, in a size. <laughs> so I got all the trophies and the qualifications and the records and championships for various things I did. Exercise, training, athletic, whatever it is. But I had a pass that I hadn't used, and that was for this, for a very different gym. And I spent a year on personal development, on awareness, on becoming a student of language, behavior, motivation, the science of brain plasticity, epigenetics, placebo, nocebo, meditation, at least 23 versions of it, realizing that no one's better than the other. And in a year, it actually took me a year, I achieved inner peace, and I would say it was, I believe, June the 6th, 2014. I was with a good friend of mine, Mike, at a conference. And all of a sudden, I surrendered. I stopped wanting to be other than I was now, realizing that I'm chasing this idea with the expense of living. Everything made sense in that moment. It was, I can still feel it now, I got the goosebumps appearing. I don't know if you want to zoom in. <laughs> but that for me was the day that I actually arrived beyond wanting more, feeling this disassociation, being angry at my past, being worried about people judging me, living for what, what I feel they would want to be the version of me that most appeases uh, their needs, deals with their insecurities, like that chameleon, constantly trying to blend in and fit. I was here, I was enough, and I didn't care compassionately whether or not you like me. Because I'm not here for more Christmas cards or more likes on Facebook. Mm. I'm here as a resource to have an impact and give back more than I've taken. I was selfish, I hurt other people, I hurt myself, and if I look behind me, there was a train wreck of destruction as I pl plundered through life, causing a lot of mess. 
And my goal now is to resolve that by giving back, by helping others, by at least giving them some clarity in order to move forward. So, you know, if, if they're stuck and you can nudge them a few inches out of that by making them see something a little bit different or bring an awareness to an area that they had no, no idea existed and now they've got an option instead of a reaction or a habit that causes pain, you've helped that person. And by helping that person, you've changed the world because now a different version of them impacts other lives as they continue their journey. You know, you think of astronomy. If you slightly move your telescope, you're looking at a different universe. When you slightly change your course in five years' time, you are no longer the person that you were. You're yeah. completely different. So, from when you found inner peace, you, were you, you were coaching strength before that? Oh, yes. Yeah, were you coaching mindset before then? or um, I realized that from probably from my undergrad in psychology that I finished about 17 years ago. You know you see this kind of timeline of what you've done and the impact it's had. It was only when I focused specifically on mindset that I realized it was a significant chunk of my coaching and always had it. Hmm. Anyone can get you in the gym and beast you and scream at you and say, do this, do this, do this. It was the ability to understand people, to see patterns, to work out that whatever resistance you place up, I can't do this. There's a way of me getting around, over or under to be on your side and help you move forward rather than standing in front of you getting angry that you're stubborn mm -hmm. or desperately trying to get a way of moving you forwards. And for me, it's quite simple. It's because coaching is the art of delivering science. Now... What do I mean by that? Well, what you do has to have purpose, otherwise you're wasting your time. Yeah. You know, we're dealing in kind of, you know, myth, guesswork, and, you know, pin the towel on the donkey blindfolded. So what you do has to have some kind of validity in order to have an impact. But many people overlook the fact that the art is often just as important, or in many instances more important, than the science. You look at strength and conditioning, it's got to be underpinned by science, otherwise you're wasting your time and guessing. Yeah. Yet, how did it appear in the first place? People had a hypothesis that wasn't proven that they took into the shop floor and tested and measured. And it's very similar with mindset because I've ventured off into the unknown, I've got a little bit of criticism from it, but come back with goodness that I've shared with clients and bang, they've stopped antidepressants. They've spoken in public, they've quit cocaine, they've opened businesses, they've changed career, ended relationships, fixed relationships, simply because I taught them how to anchor confidence, how to resolve their past, the fact that it doesn't exist anymore apart from a memory in their head. But when they play, they become a victim to it based on changes in biochemistry. So when you're aware at the level of an observer, understanding the cause and effect nature of our pain, then you are also the architect that can go in and initiate change. And that for me was the biggest thing. Instead of being that pinball that's going, ouch, bang, why me? It's taking stock of how we operate, where our time goes, who influences us, what are the consequences of these, of these behaviors? What am I twofold doing that's causing pain or running away from that's gonna help me evolve? For me, awareness is change. All change comes from awareness. Okay. So, I mean, awareness has definitely been a recurring theme of not just now, but mm -hmm. the things we've been talking about for the last 36 hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not, not the last 36 hours straight. Not we're, stuff, not, no. we're, not, we're not having one um, of those fueled by caffeine up all night. No, no, no. Talk about the mind until the mind goes and numb itself to sessions. But what is, are there any, I mean, we know that there are, as you say, you change that, that, that position in the telescope a slight amount. Mm. Is, there any, is there anything that you could suggest to someone that would be a, a, an easy way for them to begin to cultivate awareness? Yeah. You are enough in this moment and always have been. And it's the thoughts that you are a work in progress, that happiness is in tomorrow, that love's conditional based on your relationships to mum, dad, teachers, parents, siblings, that make us believe that we're fragmented, that we're broken, that we're not enough. Because we're bombarded with reasons to be broken. Mm. You've got to look a certain way, say a certain thing, have the house, have the car, be up there. But it's okay to be you. 
because we're taught it's okay not to be us, that we need more, that we've got to collect and, and chase and look like the ideal, and we don't have to. When you get rid of all of that, I call it the odd sock syndrome. Have you ever been at the mercy of the odd sock syndrome? Bottom, bottom, looking for it desperately into the bottom of the laundry basket. <laughs> that is the true, authentic, valuable, vulnerable self. That, as a toddler, doesn't question life. You know, mum, dad, do I have any worth? <laughs> <laughs> you know, attempting to walk, falling over, perhaps it's not for me, I'll quit. I, I know when I'm losing. When they're tired, they sleep. Some of them scream, I'll get that. When they're hungry, they let you know. When they want something, they are militant until they get it. But we kind of chill out. We, we get phased. We are faced with so much misinformation from so many sources. We almost fear taking action because someone is going to have some resistance. It's going to anger someone or someone else is going to critique or troll if you look at the world of online. And therefore, what's happened, probably within the last few years, I mean, we discussed it earlier, looking at motivation. Thinking leads to inaction most of the time. Mm. We overthink. We think about thinking about the consequences of things when people judge us and we feel terribly embarrassed. Therefore, if I don't step out, no one can say anything. But if you also don't step out, you are not living. You're in a comfort zone, you're trapped. And the idea of life is to share your gifts, or at least develop them until you can share them, and to be of service to others. Life's very simple. You are here for a specific reason. To have a massive impact on many, many lives. With whatever it is you do, you could be a fantastic gardener, yeah. a photographer, a coach, a wedding planner, a musician, a, a film star. It, you could sit there and be a widget cranker, mm. but people benefit from that. If your skills are completely out of line with what it is you're currently doing, then you've got to ask questions. Are you a widget cranker that's a blues guitarist yeah. or an author or an amazing X, Y, and Z that's playing safe and hiding? Therefore, your talent is not being shared. You're hiding. And the danger there is you cannot do that long term. That cripples you. It leads to illness. In many instances, it leads to addiction and suicide because we're not here for nine to fives. We're not here for employment. We're here to passionately share what is our unique gift and talent that for many people isn't on the radar yet, and I'll tell you why. It's on the radar when you are ready to put the shoes on and walk the path. No one angry at the world becomes a successful coach that trains 10,000 people. Yeah. They create destruction. They bring forth many people to suffer together so that when misery's got company, we can all kind of get angry in a, in a kind of abundant way. When you do the right thing for the right reason, when you have developed yourself to a level where you have value, you know you're enough, and you know that 90% of the time you can help someone move from pain to a degree of improvement. Whatever that journey looks like, whatever it is they turn up with. And even realizing that as a coach, what they've said is their problem usually isn't. Mm. It's usually a symptom. It's usually the effect. The core is what's causing this symptom. And when you address that, and that, that's the power of mindset, someone that's overweight turns up and is desperate to lose weight. I get that. But there's a reason you're overweight. And when we look at that and realize that you are at war with the person in the mirror and have been for many years, you hate who you see. In their own words, I've had many clients say, I hate the fat pig in the mirror. And they've gone baggy clothes. They've gone next size up in the uh, catalog when they order stuff. They've not gone out because people are looking at them, judging them. And what you've got there is a very insidious but predictable cycle of when we are at war with self, no longer a valued priority in our lives, sabotage begins. When we binge and rage the, raid the fridge, believing that no one's watching us, as a conscious being, we are aware of everything we do. Mm -hmm. And that's the first stage of sabotaging the relationship, developing a lack of trust with self. I've helped people lose several stone that I've never met, simply spoke to them online. Why? Did we talk about macros? No. Did we talk about the balancing of micronutrients and hydration and counting calories and weighing your food? No, we didn't mention anything. Did we talk about periodized programs and going in the gym and having a 
slight decrease in calories in order to lose weight, not at all. We ask them if they're happy. We mention the importance of healing the relationship with the person in the mirror. And all of a sudden they started to treat themselves with a little bit more kindness, with compassion. Put in self first, not in a selfish way, but in a self first way. Same as if you're on a plane, I tell you to put your oxygen mask on. Yeah. You can't help the world dead. Yeah. When your cup is empty, you have nothing to give. When we accept ourselves in this moment, when we allow ourselves to be the top of our list, when we treat ourselves with compassion, we do what's essential for growth and personal development, then we become a powerful resource because when that abundance is here, you've got to get rid of something, otherwise it consumes you. Yeah. You've got to help other people. You can't give from empty. And when it's overflowing, you've got to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We talked about this earlier. Um, Absolutely. In that whole situation where if you aren't giving um, with that, you kind of actually holding yourself back and you're doing yourself damage if you are. It's like holding your breath. Yeah, you exactly. Like five minutes. You got to give. Life, life is flow, ebb and flow. Yeah. Money is a mutual exchange. Breath, ebb and flow. It's a stop start. Outside is constantly evolving, and if we are not, we're at odds with it. Yeah. We're in this river trying to stop it moving because we want everything to be predictable and controlled. Yet it's constantly evolving and moving, and if we're not with it. We're against it. We're against nature. We're against life. We're against progress. That's why people hurt. They want everything to make sense and be predictable. Life doesn't always make sense. Random stuff happens. Now, when you walk through a forest, do you, do you enjoy perfectly straight lines, all, high, all trees the same height, and any fallen stick neatly laid out so they don't look an eyesore? And the well managed the forest is. <laughs> it's chaos, isn't it? It's yeah. chaos on fire. It's winding. It's random and that's why it's beautiful because it's unpredictable because it has an impact on the senses yeah and then we spend most of our life living in square boxes there's a bit of a disparity there i mean if you really want to look at why a lot of people suffer many theorists both evolutionary economic even psychologists and psychiatrists have said that what they believe in terms of theory and i've seen this probably 11 times from very intelligent people as a species, we have gone bim, bim, bim in the last couple of centuries. Mm -hmm. Technology has gone whoosh. Yeah. Now, if you go back far enough, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers doing a ton of exercising, building and making things active, mentally, fear-based, what's going to run and try and eat us, or a random tribe is going to come and try and take us over, kill us or enslave us. Therefore, we are busy, we're on edge, not in a bad way. We're on edge, but to manage it. And a very good book looking at that is why cerebrals don't get ulcers. Yeah. Switched on, switched off, back to normal. Mm -hmm. With us, switched on, stays on forever, we get ulcers. Yeah. <laughs> we panic, we can't sleep, we can't meditate, we're busy, we're on Prozac, Monster, Red Bull. You like Monster, then? I love Monster. <laughs> <laughs> a bit too much. And what we can do now is we can sit at home, order things from our phone, we don't have to talk to people because we've got a screen, and, and we've stopped living, and we can access the world's knowledge from this device, yet we don't talk to our neighbours. Mm. We've got a thousand friends online and we've got three people we know in the real world. Yeah. Or we sit at home talking and arguing online about cat videos and how this guy can't swing a kettlebell right, or look at this Mickey Mouse trainer, mm. what an idiot. And I think, well, look at where your time goes and what you get in terms of that investment. Well, it really is an investment. Yeah. You're throwing life into the abyss of no return. Could you not spend your time in a better way so that it has an impact? Now, for me, coaching is the only triple win. You help someone, they get elevated. You feel great because you've helped someone and you get paid for it. <laughs> you tell me any other business exchange where there's a triple win. Mm. There's not many. There are some, but in many instances, there's compromise, there's barter, there's... They feel a bit sore, but they're okay with it. In coaching, when you help someone with clarity, understand why, and make progress, you can't feel bad after that. You know, coaching is, is quite simply one of the few jobs where the goodness that you share is your own supply. 
Mm. I've had people say to me at a workshop, you know, don't you get bored standing up the front giving us all this information? I said, I don't need drugs. I just see you guys get it and nod and make notes and that keeps me fired up for days. Yeah. People have gone out and fixed relationships. In the lunch break, they've called their brother that they haven't spoke to for 12 years. They've started to realize that that bridge isn't burned. It's still there. Anyone that you've had a minor disagreement with is simply a phone call or a coffee shop visit away. You know, the worst thing you want is for them to no longer be here and you're left with, why? Why did it get to this? Well, there was many opportunities for me to resolve it. Wasn't it? I don't know, actually. That one, that, that one went deep. <laughs> sometimes, it depends how big your shovel is, you know. Some, sometimes I, with, with many clients as well, sometimes I say to them, you know, we'll, we'll be having a little bit of banter and discussing where they are and the time of year and what they do. And I say, pause, okay, would you like me to shoot an arrow and hit a bullseye? They're a bit shocked when I tell them what they've got, why they've got it, and how they feel on a daily basis. And they go, I said, well, that's my job. Mm. Your language comes from a belief system that tells me why you are stuck. Why? Because you become who you are. You attract towards you based on who you are, not what you want. The language comes from a belief system that then initiates behaviors that do things that either sabotage or create. What you are is a sum total of your beliefs. Most of them need some tweaking or readjustment because they come from people that did their best. You get little toxic pieces of jigsaw puzzle where scarcity appears, where love's conditional, where you, you can't do that, you're just as useless as your brother was. How can you expect to go, look at this idiot, who's he kidding? And then you hear that from an authority figure that you respect. You'll take it on board. Yeah. It will be a part of your world map and you will live congruent with that limit forever. That's how serious this work is. Mm. I mean, I, I've helped people that are suicidal. I've, helped, I've worked with rape victims, domestic abuse, attempted suicide, drug addicts, people that are, we're talking very bad places. And for any one of them, it's so important to realize that if you are still alive, you can change the ending of your story. Yeah. And I believe that with 100% across the board. Some people are kicking and screaming. Some people are la, 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 don't want to hear it. Mindset, we're not going there. But you've also got to realize, and this is a very important part of coaching because a lot of people have said to me, it hurts when there's resistance. I know I can help you, but you don't want it. It's like they're crawling through the desert, dying. And you say, would you like a glass of water? And they say, I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> You're half dead. They're not ready. And you've got to understand that when they're not ready, they're not ready. You walk on and you, you let them know, look, I'm, I'm here as a resource when the time's right. Yeah. And that's where it ends. And they may get back to you. I've had it many times where in a month's time they'll say, when can I see you? In six months' time they'll reply to your message. <laughs> you know, people are where they are. Some of them are in such a bad place. You can only understand it when you've been there. They do not go out. They don't have breakfast. They're living in front of daytime TV, cursing. They've, they've, they've had the same underpants on for a week. You know, the, the graphics aren't nice outside, so I'm going to stay in here and stay put. Apathy creeps in, and that's a very, very dangerous place. We simply give up. We see the negative and everything, and we can't be bothered. And then health slips, relationships slip. We, we don't go out. We basically don't care that much at all. Mm -hmm. And when you can help someone to make progress that is in a bad place, that's the gift that keeps on giving because if they've got children, the best version of them appears as a resource that educates them and helps them develop. If mum and dad are at war with each other, if mum's obese, and I don't, I don't say this in a bad way, you know, people that are overweight, they're not demons, they're not bad people, they're not terrible people, but I make people very aware it's basically cleaning the mirror and saying, this is what you've got. That's the coach. It's bringing clarity to your life and your impact. If they've got young children and the children see clinically obese mum, hating who she is, mm. angry all the time, but still, they're getting misinformation. They are very clever. They realize what's said, but also what's not said. And that little sponge starts to form a world map. 
And if mum's at war with herself, or dad, or both of them, yeah. you know, if, if health isn't abundant in that household, you've got a very good idea what's going to happen to the child. Mm. It isn't a thing that's been drummed into them. They've actually got the opposite of it. So I say to them, this is no longer about you. It's bigger than you. It's not I hate who I am and therefore I've tried this and tried that and tried that and I've become helpless because nothing's worked, therefore I've accepted I'm a failure. You're, you've got small people running around. In 10 years' time, you won't be able to play with them because you're in a mobility scooter <laughs> or leaning on the fence, desperate to get your breath because your knee don't work, your shoulder's broken, you've got back pain because you're seven, eight stone overweight. I said, that's the reality of it. You can change it. And it may well be the biggest thing you've ever done in life. Mm. Kicking, screaming, and hating. Coach, life, and everyone. But I've said, consider this. For many of us, we have to take a dip before we bounce back. And obviously, that's super compensation. If you look at the gas principle by Hans Sailing, 1946, I believe, but don't quote me. <laughs> but interestingly enough, there is that fitness fatigue model where for some people, they're going to have to feel even worse to then bounce back. Yeah. We sit here with an element of numbness. But we're almost okay with you know we're not comfortable we're a little bit numb we're ticking over life's average and then you're going to be told what to eat and deal with your stuff on all levels and go to the gym and not spend time three hours an evening watching tv and step up and take responsibility for your life as a responsible accountable adult and deal with it not everyone wants to hear that they will run away and hide they will feel uncomfortable but what happens as a result of that when you've done your year or 18 months in the trenches yeah. and you've created health and you actually like the person you are before you lost the weight because that's a key component. Not I'll be happy when, yeah. I'm happy now. Yeah. I love myself unconditionally. I am at peace with who I am and understand my worth and value because then you are ready to deal with your stuff. No one happy and at peace with themselves runs off and buys crap and binges it. Sorry, blanket statement, I get it, but that doesn't happen. I've had clients fix their relationship and lose weight simply because they have honored this vehicle instead of treating it with malice. That's the difference. They will find time for the gym instead of catching up on EastEnders. Yeah. Because no one on their deathbed wants more episodes of EastEnders <laughs> or arguments on Facebook or videos of cats doing somersaults on a skateboard. They want more time with their children with their friends, for experiences. And that's the thing. Time's running out. One day, you are no longer going to be here. But we don't want to hear that. No. That's scary. <laughs> we're not going to die. We're immortal. Surely. Well, I, why? Because I'm still here. I haven't gone yet. Therefore, I've got time. So I'll deal with that later. And I'll deal with that later. And yeah, you know, a bit of a belly. It's okay. It's not life-threatening. Deal with that later as well. Why? I'm so busy with my career. Bang, and then the radar goes smash, and a big health issue appears, and it's too late. Look at where your time goes. Step up and make the things that are important a priority. I mean real stuff, health, relationships, business. Where does your time go? If you are spending 20 hours a week watching TV, overweight, miserable, and in a job you hate, I say your priorities are wrong. Now, you may not like hearing that. I don't care. Because it's done with compassion. Mm -hmm. I never change anyone's life by going, there, there, it's okay. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to get in there with a stick of dynamite. Because you've got to destroy that map of this is okay. You are no one special. You deserve it. Because that's what they're playing on a daily basis. For them, there's no way out. I'm a victim. Dad said I'm no one special. Who am I kidding? I'm, I'm not going to do anything with my life. Until you move on from that, you will accept your lot. Survival will keep you based in a comfort zone where anything new is met with massive resistance and we push it away. Anyone can do it, but they really do it alone. Often they need someone, not that drags them or pushes them, but, but steps up side by side them and says, you know what, we'll do this together. Mm. I will start you moving so that eventually you don't need me anymore. And that, for me, is coaching. Yeah. Creating independence. Not having someone on the lifeline yeah, where you've got, you've got a client for life kind of thing. If someone's with me in 12 months, they're either far too keen or I've messed up. <laughs> 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 well, they like you. Who knows? Yeah. You know, I've got a PT client that rocks up every week and sees, has been with me for over a year now. 
he enjoys it. So this is my weekly hit. I feel great. There's a bit of banter. We lift. We joke about this, joke about that. But he says, you know what? And his why is because he knows people younger than him that are no longer here. Mm. That are struggling. They've had a hip replacement. They're on a stick. They're in a scooter. They've got a great big beer belly. And he said, if you don't manage it, it knocks you flat one day, doesn't it? I said, yeah. You're taking care of it. He's lost weight. He's more mobile. His energy's gone up. He's got that zest for life and that, you know, fair play to the guy. He is stepping up and taking responsibility. That, to me, is a wonderful thing because he's using his time, realizing that it's running out. Mm. And for some people, they need that level of motivation. I have walked a client through a graveyard and I've said, you're here soon. Make it a good story. <laughs> exactly. They, they <laughs> were numb. They were numb. Yeah. For me, the end, the, 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 the end justify the means. You know, I wouldn't sit there cracking someone on the head and actually inflicting physical pain, far from it. But when your awareness is non-existent to the extent that you're the hamster in the wheel, going to a job, now obviously this is a bit of a generalization, I get that. But this would apply to a huge chunk of planet Earth. Going to a job that is okay, that pays the bills, feeds the kids in a relationship that is so size it's ups and downs and our time kind of goes into things that distract us a bit of numbness a bit of celebrity entertainment that kind of thing and maybe health not being taken care of personal development's not a high priority maybe there's a lot of stuff that's in our life that's quite toxic until someone comes along that makes you aware not only of what that's done previously until now and what it's doing now, but what it's going to do in the future, you're never in a position to change it because we just accept it. Desperate to escape it, which is why we're never present. Going through the motions, pushed and pulled by other stuff. Worried about this, angry about this, how dare they, am I good enough? That's going to fall to pieces so I won't do it. Can't believe that person done that. And we're... We're present when we have a car crash. Mm. Bang, pulled into this moment, heightened sensory awareness, focusing on exactly what is happening in the moment. My job, first and foremost, is awareness and making people realize that they have a choice. They have a choice when something happens of moving from knee-jerk unconscious reaction, which is largely habit, to pausing. Now, you can't pause the world and like pick the matrix bullets out of the sky. But you can pause based on what happens next. So here's a thing that's landed on your lap. The red mist rises and we jump in, beating our chest, either defending our honor or ego or fisticuffs. How dare you say that to me? Pausing it means that you've got time to reflect. Mm -hmm. Because your knee-jerk unconscious habit that is a wired pathway in your brain is usually your one, two or three second response. When we pause, we give ourselves an alternative, yeah. which previously didn't exist. So here is a thing that is very real. It's just happened, and I am in it situationally. How does it end so that I'm not a victim of suffer? And that's how you take back control of your life. That's power. That is very different to sitting there, positive thinking, hoping that all your ills go away because of wish fulfillment. It doesn't. Positive thinking is a good start. If there's no action congruent with breaking down the distance between you and a goal, it goes nowhere. Yeah, That's why I'm not a massive fan of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. Positive action, yeah, yeah, well done. Positive thinking, it's a start, but if that's all that's there, you know, someone that's 20 stone sitting on the sofa, I'm healthy and happy. Got to try harder, it's not working yet. <laughs> I'm, or Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. People actually thought that you read the book and Amazon delivered suitcases and like, you know, a bit of jest, but <laughs> you get the idea. What happens is when you set yourself up mentally, realize what it is you want as a goal and that small action steps are the way that you achieve it. Now, you don't get off your sofa and run the London Marathon, do you? Nope. You don't go to uni and get your certificate on the end of week one. You don't go to the gym and become an elite athlete in a month. No. Why would it happen in the other area of life? Mm. That's the thing. It takes time, but time's all we've got. 
for some people it's going to take at least a year to change their life or, or even begin that journey of of ownership yeah. acceptance awareness responsibility you know th these people are in my life why they are absolutely toxic now if it's your partner obviously big questions have to be asked but i've I wouldn't say I've ended as many relationships as Facebook has. I'm nowhere near that level. But I've had people see me on a Sunday and quit work Monday. Because they have zoomed out, looked at where their time's going and said, how is this a thing? Why am I doing this? What purpose does it serve other than giving me £10 for an hour of life? Pointless. Pointless waste of time. Anything else, sir? Well, yeah. How, well, how are we? I have no idea. I, I, no, I didn't even know. Uh, we've been going for 40. 40 minutes. 40 okay. minutes. You said about. <clears throat> so I'll go with the, my, the, my two favorite questions. <coughs> Your magic the, questions. The only ones that I warned you about. Um, so, what is one of. So it's about best and worst advice that's out there best as, 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 as it stands. So for, we'll start off with the worst advice. What's the worst advice you see too many people taking or too many people giving? Quick fixes. The. It doesn't require effort, mm. that you need a guru, that there's a certain way, that it looks a certain way. Because the problem there is not realizing that your path's your path, yeah. and that's it. You can't nick someone else's. You can't walk someone else's. It's their journey. There is so much bad information out there because a lot of it's free. We've got Google, we've got Wikipedia, we've got umpteen websites where at the click of a, of, a, of a button we're in and we're bombarded with 10,000 places to go and, and look stuff up. A lot of it is misinformation and because we are conf got, because we've got conflicted information we're, we are overwhelmed and therefore we fail to take the first step. Mm. Key thing here is, and it's a very good quote from David Allen, motivational speaker, kind of like business mentor and leadership. And he said, when you have a goal, there are two things to consider. What does it look like finished? And what's the next action step I can take to start to bridge that gap? Yeah. Because unless you have taken a step, it's a dream. Yeah. And if it's a dream, it's not time bound. It's not real. And therefore, it simply sits there as an I would like and a maybe, and it would be cool if, but it doesn't actually exist. When you've written it down and taken an action step, it's moved from a possibility to something that is actually active. Therefore, at some point in the future, through repetitive, disciplined commitment, you're going to achieve it. The biggest problem I see is misinformation and a lot of people... Now, I see this online quite often. It's okay asking someone, do you know a local plumber? I yeah. get that, or, you know, I don't know this, can you help me? But I see people asking their tribe, you know, all their Facebook friends, about very important life issues, which, yeah, I, I get it, but then when you ask someone something that is extremely important to you, and you get back 50 different versions of it from people that may either have no idea of what it is, have never been on that journey, Mm. or actually have achieved something similar but made a right balls up of it, what happens if you then take that advice? Mm. Imagine asking 50 people what you should do for a career. You're going to get 50 answers, and you're going to get more confusion than you turned up with. Yeah. Because the answer ain't out there, it's in here. What are you aligned with? What do you like doing? Because instead of saying, what can I earn money from, it's what do I enjoy doing? Follow your excitement. Get rewarded financially. Notice I didn't say paid. Yeah. Get rewarded for the value that you offer based on living in alignment with your goals and purpose. My goals are simple. Create a million happy people. And a lot of people say that number should be bigger. <laughs> I'm beginning to think it should do now. After, especially after we've looked into the ripple effects. But. <clears throat> it keeps going out there. I mean, you help someone that then mentions it and then refers a book or a course or a PDF and they get inspired and they make a little adjustment and change and a different version of them appears and talks to their children differently. So now their life path's slightly different. It's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. So that's your worst one. You're going to ask me a different one. I'm going to ask you for the, the best piece of advice that you the think people best aren't hearing enough. The piece of advice. Or maybe they're hearing and they're not taking 
that you have value simply for the very reason that you are alive and watching this. You have value because of life. You are enough because you are alive. You have abundant power, possibility, potential, creativity, abundance. Yet years of doubt and conformity and worry have allowed so many people to play safe, to choose employment over passion. And I think I'll finish on a very powerful story. There was a speaker doing a talk and he asked the audience where the most valuable place on the planet was. And someone put their hands up and said the Arab state, the oil. And he said, no, no, no. Next person asked, said, uh, diamond mine, South Africa. He said, no, not even close. Third person, North America, GDP. No. It's the graveyard. And you can imagine, shock, tumbleweeds blowing across the stage, everyone's kind of, has this guy lost the plot, graveyard. And he said, I'll tell you why, because in that graveyard exists every invention that could have changed humanity, that never appeared. Every book that was never written, every movie that never appeared, every play and poetry masterpiece that died with their owner because instead of sharing their greatness, they doubted and it died with them. So the point of this is stop waiting for permission. Realize that wherever you are now does not indicate where you will finish. It may take you a week to move across and start to at least initiate change as a catalyst. It may take you months, it may take you years to retrain and develop the skill set that will then go forwards and create a meaningful and abundant life. But all you have is time, and at the end of your journey, you have one of two things. Memories or regrets. Regrets weigh a ton and will probably kill you early. Memories happen because you showed up, delivered, really didn't care about the opinions of others in a nice way, not in a nasty, selfish, ego, arrogant way. But when you understand that many people hide because of worry about what other people think, we, we wouldn't do this if we worried about what people think. Mm. You could type under this, this guy's an idiot, I can assure you I don't care. Because your comments don't pay my mortgage. <laughs> they don't feed my kids. They don't. It's, it's in a, like, we're moving over into a little bit of jest, but I operate from compassion, and people get the best of me, whether they pay me or not. I deliver. I help. I actually care, and that is such an important part of coaching. When you realise the impact that you could have had by fully showing up and delivering, compared to the impact you're currently having by playing safe and hoarding those gifts that may be fully developed, partially developed, or not on the radar, then all of a sudden it becomes essential to get out there and have a positive impact on humanity. That's it. Well done. Um, final question. Final Quick question. and easy one. Quick and easy one. Where can we find you on social media if anyone wants to Oh no, 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 you. no, I'm flying for two months, you can't get me. <laughs> You can this one probably, this probably won't go up until after that anyway. All right, no. I might be back I've, still, I've still got a bit of work. That was, a, that was a short holiday, so I'm back. <laughs> anyway, the best place to find me is on Facebook, Stephen H. My closed group that is quite active. There's a hell of a lot of coaches in there that deliver a lot of stuff, and that is called the Inner Peace Project on Facebook. And what I'll also do when I've done it is I'll provide you a link for a nice little free video course for people that have got something from this. They can get a little bit more where we look at language, fear, uh, creating resourceful states, how to resist being constantly pulled by past and future so that we're majority of our time spent in the present moment. We look at brain plasticity and how to no longer be a victim to all of these thoughts that keep manifesting and kind of driving behavior or 
in action. And I also think that one of them looks at the benefits of meditation. So that'll be a nice little kind of free gift for people that have endured us for 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> think of it as a kind of, um, you know, a compensation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. Other than that, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So thanks, guys, for watching and or listening, whether you're on the video or on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have Steve on. Um, we will be back next week with another show. Um, thanks again. Take care.